Hello. Can everyone hear me? How's everyone this afternoon? Good. Excellent. Special welcome. Great to see so many of you here in this plenary session and uh, after a full day as well. I'm not sure what the situation is online, but I hope that we have at least as many participants joining us virtually for this final plenary session where we'll talk about financing sustainable development. I am well aware that following a break, especially one that involves refreshments, that's a bit of a tough act to follow, but we have a wonderful panel whom I'm sure will keep us all engaged during this afternoon. I will just offer a few introductory remarks to background the session before we jump into the discussion. By the way, my name is Denise Wall. Um, now, I'll be facilitating the conversation on how we can address the investment gaps hindering achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We all know these are ambitious targets. They include eliminating poverty and hunger, as well as promoting gender equality, good health and well-being, quality education, clean energy, water and sanitation, and decent work and economic growth for all, excuse me. Uh, before we go any further, though, I'd like to recognize the team here at UNU Wider. They are the kind organizers and sponsors of this important event. As you all already know, UNU Wider is a think tank and a research institute that plays the critical role of providing economic analysis and policy advice to promote sustainable and equitable development. Now, if you'll indulge me a little bit, on a personal note, I have called Finland my home for more than 20 years, but my background is in the Caribbean. And I've seen encouraging initiatives by leaders such as Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley to harness financing from multilateral banks and institutions to do things like accelerate the transition to net zero, advance worker empowerment, and boost resilience while engaging with ongoing climate policy reforms. Now, while that's undoubtedly a step forward, uh, I believe that scholars and policymakers are increasingly looking to see how we can advance the SDGs through domestic resource mobilization, and I know that there's been ample discussion about that during the course of the day. But now, let's take a step back to 2015, when the Addis Ababa Action Agenda established the foundation for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This program set out a framework to finance sustainable development by aligning financial policies and finance flows with economic, social, and environmental priorities as well. Sadly, though, a global divergence from this path in the past few years, the pandemic, which we've heard much about today as well, and Russia's war in Ukraine seem to have led us to a situation where the great finance divide, as it's now known, could translate into a wider and deeper sustainable development divide. In developing economies, the financing gap threatening achievement of the SDGs is estimated at between 2.5 and 3 trillion US dollars a year. Moreover, we've heard the World Bank warn that we seem to be inching closer to losing a decade of development unless we adopt ambitious initiatives to boost labor supply, productivity, and investment. And of course, to do that, we need to aggressively finance sustainable development, and that's what we're here to discuss today. With our esteemed panel of experts from around the world, and they will help us understand the realities on the ground and to discuss ways to bridge the global SDG financing gap. Now, uh, after sitting patiently, listening to me, I'd like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves in 30 seconds or less, so no pressure. Um, one of our panelists, by the way, uh, Millie Nalukwago, is joining us remotely from Uganda. There she is. 
So maybe we can start with you, Millie. You are 30 seconds or so to introduce yourself. Thank you so much, Denise. I join you to thank you wider for hosting us. My name is Amili Nalukwagoi Singoma. I've worked with Revenue Administration for 27 years, doing research and planning, research with UNUWAIDA. I am now working at the Bank of Uganda as Director of Statistics for one and a half years. Thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you, Millie. 30 seconds on the nose. Uh -huh. And I should point out that Millie has also overseen 80 national and international level research papers on tax policy and administration as head of research planning and development. Let's now move on and see how Dan Banik does with his 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, Dan Banik, I'm a professor of political science uh, at the University of Oslo, where I also direct the Oslo SDG initiative. Uh, a couple of years ago, I stumbled into academic podcasting, so sometimes I'm also known as a podcaster. Uh, it takes a lot of time, uh, and sometimes I'm tempted to quit my job as a professor and become a full-time podcaster. Thank you. Looking forward to hearing more about that during the, the, the break, or rather during the reception, Dan. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, let's now hear from Rose Ngugi. Yeah, my name is uh, uh, Rose Ngugi. I am currently the, car the executive director uh, Kenya Institute for Public Policy Research and Analysis, uh, which is um, a, a government uh, a think tank, and uh, we focus uh, quite a lot uh, uh, on economic policy in terms of building capacity for the policy making process, uh, researching on to give evidence for the policy process, as well as uh, 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 having networks and engagement with stakeholders uh, to discuss matters policy. Thank you, Rose. A bit of background to, to Rose's introduction there. She was also in the office of the executive director at Africa Group One at the International Monetary Fund. Moving on, uh, let's jump back to Peter Chaula uh, for his 30 seconds. Thank you, uh, I'm Peter. I work at the, Uni uh, the United Nations Secretariat in New York. I'm in the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Uh, we have a, a division called Financing for Sustainable Development Office, which uh, sort of handles the follow-up to the Financing for Development process and the Addis Ababa Action Agenda um, and the ongoing negotiations and discussions in New York. Uh, I work in the Policy Analysis and Development Branch uh, which focuses on, on policy and research issues, uh, and particularly we lead uh, an international uh, task force called an interagency task force on financing for development, uh, which produces an annual report every year on the fin financing for sustainable development report, which, and I lead the chapters on domestic resource mobilization. So that's why I'm here today uh, to help you, to help walk you through some of what we've found in our reports internationally. Thank you. Fantastic. Peter also recently authored a paper on how beneficial ownership information supports fair taxation and financial integrity and helps reduce illicit financial flows while increasing the availability of resources for financing sustainable development. Last but not least, Emilia Skurk. Hi, good, uh, good evening. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I am practice manager in the... Um, uh, um, department, global department of the World Bank that is uh, covering fiscal policy and sustainable development. In, in the department, uh, we are responsible for the domestic revenue mobilization agenda um, and the whole revamp that World Bank is leading now uh, internally. I have also my past in the public sector. I've been responsible for taxes in Polish Ministry of Finance, and I have my past in the private sector working as an account accountant to help companies optimize taxation. So I guess I have the broad, broad range of experience and will be happy to share with you today. Yeah, on a more personal note, one thing I can say about Emilia is that she is an art lover. So that's a conversation piece for when you guys break off for the reception later on. Well, now that we've got the formalities out of the way, let's get into the discussion. And I should tell you that it's going to be divided into two segments. Uh, in the first segment, uh, I will lead a conversation with our experts. Uh, and in the second, we will open the floor for audience questions and comments. And I'll let you know when that time comes. 
Now, I know that you're all very experienced and, uh, and experts in your subject areas, uh, and if you'd like to comment on each other's responses or contributions, feel free, free, please feel free, just raise your hand and I'll recognize you, and I really would like us to have a sort of animated and informal exchange of ideas, which means that I'm gonna move away from this spot and come a bit closer to you so that we can get the conversation started. And I will start with you, since you're seated closest to me. I'm not sure if you're, you might be rethinking your, yeah, <laughs> you might be rethinking. <laughs> but Dan, you wear many hats. You're an academic, you're an SDG expert. Uh, you're, uh, by the way, appointed by the Norwegian government and you're a podcast host, as we just learned. Now, tell us briefly about some of the methods or instruments that you feel uh, will help finance the SDGs uh, as proposed by this expert committee on which you sit. Thanks. I, I must make very clear that I'm not a government appointee. I'm here as an academic. Uh, but I was a part of this expert group that the uh, Norwegian Ministry of International Development put together and gave us a mandate to, for doing three things. One had to do with how should we spend the tens of billions of Norwegian krona, the 1% of gross national income that Norway provides in aid. How can we do this effectively to finance sustainable development? Uh, a second part of the mandate we were given was to talk a little bit about or give some advice on global public goods and the financing for that. And thirdly, as you know, there's a lot of debate in Europe about different types of ways in which governments are using the aid budget within their own borders, whether there are certain exceptions to the official development assistance rules that we could come up with. So very briefly, I can highlight some of the suggestions that we've given in this report, which is also available online. Uh, the first had to do with uh, being very ambitious, you know. Um, aid is only one small part of the equation. But we had to, of course, our focus was aid. There's a lot of other things that can be done. I'm sure we can talk about it. But one thing that we said was that we need to increase from 1% to 2% of GNI. And, of course, this is very controversial. You know, every sector wants more money. We want more money for aid. So that was very clear. Why? Because there's a lot of demand for it. Uh, Norway, there's a lot of expectations on Norway because we are rich, because we're earning more money, because of the war. There are all kinds of reasons, but we also have financial muscle and capacity. So we should increase from 1% to 2%. That was the first recommendation. The second had to do with coming up with an approach that required some sort of a change in, in the way we think. So we, should, we, we actually suggest we should move from charity and donation to a framework that we call investing in our common future. It, it builds on you know, the Brundtland Commission's report, uh, Our Common Future. So we want to you know, use the concept of investments. We would like the Norwegian government, NORAD, others to really revisit their portfolio and think about clear targets, think about clear ways of evaluating uh, their efforts. So, uh, a focus on impact, effectiveness, evaluations, that kind of stuff. And then thirdly, we wanted to make a difference between this growing in, uh, interest in global public goods and poverty reduction. When we, and we interacted with, you know, all the UN agencies, the bank, the G77, a lot of developing countries, low-income countries, are really worried that the global north is going to spend a lot of money to finance global public goods and development will be forgotten. So we suggest that at least if we are to stick to the 0 point, uh, the 1% GNI principle, 0.7% of our GNI, the Norwegian aid, should be ring-fenced, should be earmarked for poverty reduction, and 0.3%, but increasing over time to 07 or even 1% on global public goods to tackle climate, health, education, you name it but poverty reduction should be ring fence protected. Um, and related to this is also, of course, the support to the private sector, because there's a lot of talk about private sector, you know, mobilizing capital. In 2015, when the SDGs came into force, uh, there was so much uh, hope put on the private sector. That has been, well, a bit of a disappointment. Um, there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, blended finance and 
how uh, the public sector can de-risk and help private sector to invest. We are basically saying that, yes, there is a role that government can play, a very important facilitating role. Uh, we have a uh, Norwegian um, investment fund called Norfund uh, that is doing a great job. Just yesterday, the report was that between 2021, the, the Glasgow COP and now, uh, Norfund was able to actually double uh, finance for climate from 7 billion to 15 billion by leveraging the power of the private sector, particularly in relation to renewable energy. So there's a lot that can be done, but this doesn't mean it's win-win. The private sector often wants, you know, uh, help in different ways. And finally, I can say, since I've been going on for a while, uh, uh, one of the big debates in sustainable development is policy incoherence. And so we thought that, you know, we could actually suggest that even in, within our country, that Norwegian government institutions uh, should strive for that kind of coherence and have a team Norway approach, and which basically means talking to each other and sharing information. But I can expand on all of these uh, later on if you wish. Thank you. Later on. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. Now, I, I, something that you said struck me, uh, which was uh, the idea of moving away from the, the concept of charity to investing in a common future and being uh, more intentional and um, more academic, let's say, uh, by looking at impact, by evaluating outcomes and measuring outcomes. And Peter, I see you nodding at me. Uh, I'll let you come to that. But I really wanted to ask Emilia, how does that resonate with your thinking? Uh, I've got mic. Uh, Look, I think that, uh, of course, um, I think that um, more coherence and more uh, focus on impact resonates with everyone uh, here. And I think that uh, uh, this, uh, um, we have to new find new ways how to uh, mobilize uh, revenues and how to bring uh, a private sector in, uh, because we've seen that, uh, you know, the whole scene that uh, that uh, we are surrounded is 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 not helping us uh, and some of these issues have been discussed uh, this morning but mm -hmm. we we see basically that the stg has the, the achieving them uh, i mean the progress have st stalled and we see that 98 countries uh, percent of countries uh, in particular in africa has been not making progress as compared to 3 years ago we, we've seen, there was discussion about you know the, the environment of growth not being favorable and and we know that growth comes with uh, extra benefit of you know bringing more revenues uh, and um, and finally we we see growing investment needs but at the same time fiscal space have been shrinking a lot and and I was shocked looking at the recent numbers as almost 50% of countries in, in the group of low-income countries have deficit above 5%. 5 uh, so, it, which means basically that, that, that the space to finance it, uh, it's, it's, it's much, much narrower. So all of these, I think, uh, push us to think uh, more into you know, how to achieve probably not only bringing private sector more into equation, and I, we can talk more how maybe how to do it. We, we knew about it in 2015, we talked about it, but, but the question is actually how one can achieve the progress there, and, and maybe even without increasing uh, resources too much, how to achieve these better results. And, and again, you know, the, in the bank there is a big effort because bank is... Uh, thinking about capital increase and uh, and, and and of course uh, uh, for the capital increase we, we need we need to really focus on how uh, domestic revenue mobilization could be strengthened and how we can show that actually we are achieving results on the ground with all the funding that we will be asking and, and you know that every every second day there is a country that has uh, going through the debt restructuring and and uh, and and we, we face it uh, every day so we are asked uh, uh, why, why, why do you change focus uh, mm. of, on and you, how you could do better on the domestic revenue mobilization and in the bank, the evolution roadmap and everything that is happening internally is linking uh, to the better results mm. orientation and how to bring uh, private ca capital more. Um, and there is a whole uh, process that I can discuss a little bit more later. Sure. I hear you on the point of domestic resource mobilization, and I'd really like to bring uh, Rose, I'm coming to you, Peter, i uh, really like to bring Rose into the conversation to ask about the role of domestic savings, for example, in financing uh, the SDGs in the sub-Saharan Africa region. 
Um, th thank you very much, uh, uh, our moderator. Um, and I want to uh, start by uh, saying that um, when you talk about uh, uh, domestic savings, uh, you are looking at uh, uh, different uh, levels, whether it's the uh, government savings, uh, she's talked about private savings, and uh, we are looking at uh, farms or business savings, as well as uh, uh, household savings. And uh, to emphasize that all of them actually uh, do matter, uh, because uh, we cannot win the war uh, in terms of uh, achieving uh, SDGs if all of us are not uh, uh, making a contribution. And just going back to the aspect of uh, government savings, you realize that um, uh, a lot of uh, infrastructure funding uh, for low-income countries comes from uh, external financing. Uh, and this is because uh, the, 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 the fiscal buffers are usually very, very uh, limited. And uh, for that reason, the only way that the government can um, uh, finance effectively, uh, whether we are talking about infrastructure, we are talking about energy projects, we are talking about uh, uh, water-related projects, we are talking about uh, uh, social protection uh, uh, kind of funding, we need to mobilize uh, adequately uh, in terms of uh, revenues and uh, also in terms of uh, getting the right mix as far as uh, even uh, uh, external funding is concerned. And recently we've been uh, reminded that, uh, you know, uh, we, we need to focus more on concessional funding, uh, but concessional funding is usually very, very limited, and uh, uh, aspects of uh, public-private uh, then partnerships come in uh, so that uh, we can finance uh, adequately. Uh, from the private sector, uh, you notice uh, from the SDGs, one of the key elements that can sort out uh, for us, uh, for example, uh, matters to do with poverty, matters to do with hunger, uh, is actually the jobs. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's not the government that provides jobs, uh, it's the private sector. And for the private sector uh, to actually expand that space for, for job creation, it needs investment. And for investment actually to be there, then aspects of uh, savings uh, uh, come in. Uh, but what you notice is the informality that is coming up in the private sector in this region, uh, which means that uh, uh, this is a sector that requires uh, some level of dynamism in the traditional uh, financial sector, uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, they may not necessarily manage to go to the capital market because they are too small to be listed to get, uh, to get funding. Uh, you also realize that uh, they may not go to uh, the banking sector uh, because uh, they are very risky. So you need also, again, to think about the de-risking of, uh, of, of, of these informal sectors. So at the end of the day, uh, it's asking how we can create then uh, an environment that facilitates them uh, to do their small, their small savings, yeah? Mm -hmm. Even if it is a, a, a dollar per day, uh, making sure that there is a, a system that can actually accommodate, uh, accommodate them. And then as far as the uh, housing sector, uh, I mean households uh, are concerned, um, every household needs to feel comfortable. They need to feel that they can smoothen their consumption today and tomorrow. Uh, that they can meet their needs uh, today and even when they grow older. That they don't need to uh, get back maybe to uh, social protection issues from the government and the like. Which means that uh, households then need to, to save uh, for their future. And in, in doing so, uh, it's also uh, saying that uh, we may need to change. Uh, in the morning, we were talking about behavioral change. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing uh, that we may want to talk about, uh, such that uh, uh, aspects of saving are instilled from the very early age. 
uh, given Let that, me... uh, for example, at the moment, we have the youth, and they need actually to contribute significantly Absolutely. in the household savings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rose. And it sounds like a really complex interplay of factors that's not easily solved. Um, so let me come uh, to you now, Peter. Thank you for your, your patience. Uh, so two things I'd like to hear from you. Uh, listening to Rose and the scenario that she has painted there, um, added to the fact that we know that many developing countries are also dealing with financial and economic stresses at the macro level, for example, high debt and stretched public finances. Um, how can uh, these regions finance sustainable development? And I'd also like you to weigh in on that very interesting point that Dan uh, mentioned earlier, which is to move away, to have a sort of a a perceptional shift away from charity to investment in a common future. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, so, I mean, let me start by saying this is a very complex environment. And I think that's one of the real strengths of the discussions at the FFD process that member states have with each other is that it, it is so multifaceted and it tries to bring together the private sector and the public finance, both the domestic and the international public finance. And it's one of the real values of having those conversations in the, in the UN at the FFD space is that you can bridge those conversations across different sectors and, and issues. Um, but I think the other thing that we've also seen very clearly in the FFD space is that there's a real need to bring together domestic reforms and policies with international structural reforms and policies. And, uh, and we've had that here at the conference today, and I think that's really valid. That it's great that we've had that. Um, because it's really important to match some of those domestic reforms with some of the issues with international norm setting and the international enabling environment. Um, and I, but I'm going to skip the international ones for now, because I think we can come back to that. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the domestic things. And I think the investment environment, the investment perspective is right, is that countries need to have a, need to really look at, you know, how things are going to pay off in the long term. And that requires a lot of domestic reforms to do that. And it is complex. One of the tools that member states agreed in the Addis Agenda that can be very useful is something called an integrated national financing framework. So many countries in Africa and across the world have started to try and draw up these uh, frameworks. And the, the real aim is to, is to unify both the way you treat domestic resources and to have a strategy for using those alongside a strategy for using private resources, for using international private resources and international public resources uh, alongside domestic ones. Because the, the real emphasis that countries made in the Addis Agenda is that all of these sources are needed, and they're complementary to each other. They are not substitutes, right? They can each do unique things. And it's really important that countries think about how to get there, right? So that your policies for dealing with, you know, sort of a small business that might not be able to uh, register on an exchange or raise financing that way, the policies for how you help them are aligned with the policies that you want to tax them, right? That you want to make those things coherent with each other so that you're, you're, str you're strategizing appropriately. Now, so the, but fundamentally at the end of the day, I sometimes get in trouble for reminding people this, you have high debt burdens in Africa and other countries. Those debts are only gonna be paid off by domestic resources. Not this year, not next year, but over the very long term, that is domestic resources. So one of the essential components is domestic resource mobilization and revenue mobilization by the state because that's the only way to fund public goods and services which are essential for delivering so many of our SDGs. They're also essential for delivering you know, inequality reductions and, but also for macroeconomic stability and management, right? You're not just talking about delivering education and healthcare which is what a lot of people think about with taxation but those social protection you know, policies, we saw during COVID times were absolutely critical, and there was a, a presentation earlier today on this, that they were absolutely critical for smoothing, you know, household consumption in a way to make sure that people are not falling into poverty and hunger. And, and unfortunately, we haven't, the world hasn't done enough. It's very clear that during COVID times, we haven't done enough, and there's much more to be done here. 
Um, the, the Financing for Sustainable Development report this year delved into a couple specific issues, but we deal with different issues over the years. We've dealt with lots of them, um, you know, from how you might want to deal with. This year, we talked specifically about some energy windfall taxes that you could use in order to raise revenue at a specific times when energy prices are high. Um, and we, uh, this year, we also talked about um, how you might align your tax systems uh, with ge your gender responsive strategies, right? To make sure that your tax systems are, are really promoting gender equality. But we've, we've covered a range of issues, climate, environment, and it's really important to align all these things uh, at, at a national level. So, uh, you know, it takes a lot of work. There will be, and, and it's really important to emphasize that reforms in the tax space and the domestic revenue space, uh, including to generate the kind of resources you need for the large scale investments we need, it's gonna take time to bear fruit. So some of the things that Emilia talked about in terms of, you know, long-term financing, increasing the capital size of the bank so that they can support countries for doing that, really important to do as well. And that's why the FFD space where you can bring these things together is really helpful. Great, thank you so much. That sounds like a great point at which to bring Millie into the conversation because Millie, from where you sit, where you sit, you are looking at, uh, you've worked with the Uganda Revenue Authority, you're now at the Ugandan Central Bank, Bank of Uganda, and perhaps in light of the conversation that we've had today, you can tell us about what uh, the tax authorities in Uganda and the role, what they're doing with this regard in terms of financing the SDGs, the role they're playing in helping uh, mobilize domestic resources. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Oh, and uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead, Millie. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Yes, uh, uh, revenue authorities in sub Saharan Africa, Uganda Revenue Authority, uh, what we are looking at uh, is a domestic revenue mobilization strategy. And I know because of time, I'll not go into the the details and all these have been presented, but I'll just give our story. So we set out in uh, 2017, 20, 2018, and worked on a domestic revenue mobilization strategy that was to run from 2019-20 to 2020-23. Now, the key about this strategy was to work with a number of agencies, it was a long period, very collaborative, led by the Ministry of Finance and the Revenue Administration. I was actually part of the team. And, and when you said I've led over 80 research papers, this is now the gist. I present the side of the user. We worked with the EU, DFID, World Bank, a number of development partners, Norway, and MDAs, research firms, interacted with civil society and brought in everything. So we come up with this strategy that looks at policy and tax administration, looking at the strengths, weaknesses, threats, and opportunities. Uh, we were able to put this together and I can say that uh, so far, despite the COVID that uh, uh, disturbed us along the way, we have seen revenue grow uh, in 2020-21, in 20, we had 11.2% growth. 21-22, we went to 114 You know, we're just coming out of COVID. And in 2022-23, we registered a growth of 16.2% in revenues, bringing on less tax policies, but a lot of tax administrative uh, initiatives supported by, by research. And for that, I must uh, really appreciate you know, WIDA, ICTD, and all these research firms we've been working with. Another area that uh, tax administrations are looking at, and specifically uh, Uganda Revenue Authority, is investment in technology for data and research. Uh, there are modern systems, not only for Uganda, but for a number of sub-Saharan African countries where tax collection is now uh, online and also uh, automated systems that uh, collect uh, transaction data. 
So if this information is put together, so what? It's very important for this information to be used. So as Uganda Revenue Authority, we invested in a data warehouse. I know that some revenue administrations have had data lakes and all this, but together with that, collaborated now again with the expert researchers, with research firms within the country and across the board, together with UNWIDA, we've also put together a data lab of anonymized data to be able to attract external researchers to bring in policy. And I liked uh, what was presented before that, that how do we invest in our future together? And for me, I see this is where the gist is, is that as, as, as sub-Saharan African countries, as Uganda, I have raw data that if I put together, an expert researcher from a development economy can, can feed on to give me um, insights that will help me be able to attract more revenue. Right. And uh, I must say that Millie, even the uh, models that are being used, very- Millie, can you I'm, hear I'm me? I'm summarizing. Can yes, you hear please. me? This is beginning to yes, sound I like a seance. You. Millie, can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much. I see where you're going. Uh, I just need to point out that uh, one of your colleagues here on the in-person panel would like to make an intervention, so I'm going to give him the, the floor. Please, uh, Dan, would you like to comment on, on what Millie has been saying well, so far? It was actually a comment for, for all of us, uh, and it had to do with domestic resource mobilization, which is absolutely crucial. But I want to refer back to what our Kenyan colleague raised this morning, basically saying that there are all of these taxes, exemptions, et cetera, that we give to companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, and that, that is a huge problem. And in many of the countries I do work in, the government is just simply interested in getting some company to come and invest. And they're willing to just give land, water, if there's electricity, even that for free. Mm -hmm. And so it is important to keep up appearances in the newspaper, et cetera, to say that, the government has got this big investment. You know, lots of jobs are going to be created. The details are never really outlined. The kind of contracts and, 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 and the conditions are never really spoken about. So I think that, that aspect is something that we can't do away with. Um, so to, to know how you know, companies can basically negotiate and say, oh, you're not going to give me a good deal, I'll go somewhere else. That, that I think is extremely crucial. I had a couple of other points, but I don't want to interrupt our colleague here. I think that's an interesting point. And now this is a question for anyone on the panel, whoever is fastest on the buzzer. Uh, what is the role there for this kind of policy coherence and this kind of coordination uh, globally, or perhaps regionally? Maybe globally is too ambitious, although we, we are in a situation where we do need to be ambitious. But perhaps at least regionally, what is the role of regional governments coming together to try and nip this kind of situation that Dan is outlining in the bud. Yeah. Th um, the floor is yours, Rose. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I think uh, I, I want to approach it uh, uh, from uh, uh, different angles. And one of the things that uh, uh, you've seen uh, happening in the African region is uh, <clears throat> efforts for economic transformation. And economic transformation through uh, the African uh, continental uh, free trade area. And the key uh, focus for this is uh, to try and see to it that uh, from the regional level, uh, you can actually uh, uh, enhance uh, productivity. Uh, you can also enhance uh, markets uh, because uh, when you have uh, many micro and small enterprises which cannot go uh, to the international level, especially for trade, uh, then it, makes, uh, uh, it, ma it gives an opportunity uh, when you're talking about uh, continental uh, free trade area to provide an environment where uh, the, the businesses can find uh, opportunities for trading, opportunities for sharing, uh, and opportunities also for learning from each other. So I believe that uh, when uh, these opportunities are coming in, uh, they are actually enhancing at regional level, uh, whether it's agricultural sector, whether it's micro and small enterprises, 
but at the same time, uh, providing opportunity for uh, what you'd call positive externalities, yeah? Positive externalities in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, even when we are negotiating with the international community, we may not necessarily have to negotiate as Kenya, we may not negotiate as Nigeria, but we can actually negotiate as a, as a region mm -hmm. and have better uh, trading uh, uh, relations uh, at, the, at the international level. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Please go ahead, Emily. Yes, I wanted to, to pick up on that point, you know, on the structural transformation, because some of the you know, points that have been raised this morning, and I think you brought that you know, we should coordinate and, and provide a, the consistent advice why not to introduce some of these extra incentives. I think that there is enough of literature saying that actually other matters like, you know, country market, competition, political stability, skills increasingly matters much more in the long term than these tax incentive in the short term. But still countries have been using it into the daily uh, business. So I think that going into the direction of structural transformation, structuring, uh, build, uh, investing in infrastructure, building this other comparative advantage is a way that is much more beneficial than mm. providing these incentives. On the coordination itself, it's probably, my example is more on the IFI side, on the institution, uh, international financial institutions. We have this platform for collaboration on tax that is a joint uh, initiative between uh, OECD, IMF, World Bank, and UN. And it actually is used for us to discuss some of these issues like international taxation, minimum tax, how to actually introduce frameworks to assess tax incentives, their cost, their impact. Uh, then another, another global issue, environmental taxation, that is a global, uh, also global issue. What is, the, what is the framework are we using? Are we total, total carbon price? How we're calculating it? And then later on, we go with the same kind of advices and frameworks to countries. So at least on the IFI side, we, we, speak, we try to speak with one voice. To, to different uh, nations and different regions. And, uh, so maybe, maybe I wanted to highlight that point on the coordination. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think this is really critical to have a coordinated view from the system. Um, to, but that, that, which also happens with our, our report, the Financing for Standard Development Report, the World Bank contributes a lot, the IMF contributes a lot, so that we can try and uh, you know, round together and, and come out with good advice. On the specific issues of tax incentives, yet yeah, this is something that we covered this year um, where, you know, there is a real issue with, uh, you know, countries undercutting each other this way and undercutting their own systems. And I think what Dan said was really interesting. The, the governments say they're going to provide water and infrastructure, and et cetera, but they get nothing in return mm -hmm. in terms of tax revenue because they've given... And what we've tried to promote for many years now is, is kind of a concept of uh, social contract, right? You provide services and goods and taxpayers pay taxes in return. And that's really a critical concept for building trust and legitimacy in the state in order to you know, then have a good cycle with improving uh, tax compliance. And we're undercutting that by having all these tax incentives and other things that are provided to businesses. So one thing that we can definitely do at the first level we've asked for is transparency, right? Mm -hmm. Not even every country says what their tax incentives are. And we need to make sure that countries are doing that um, for the accountability to their own citizens so that they can, you know, citizens can see, well, who's getting tax incentives and, and what are they being used for? And then we've recommended things like regular renewal of these incentives, review and renewal before you, you give them out again, um, things like this. So I think this is really critical. Uh, component of what can be done. But at the international level, you can do some coordination. Uh, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, no, Everybody can see how difficult the Pillar 2 conversations have been at the OECD. Um, but I think there is space to do this at the regional level. You know, The EU does it. The African Union is going to move in that direction with the Africa you know, trade pact because the, the open borders are going to force them to, right? And I think that's, that's not a bad thing. That, that will force some conversations on how to scale back some, some of these incentives. The question is if we could get a full global approach, that would be, that would be nice. I, I, it's something that we should aim for. It's not something we should give up on, but it will take time. Thank you for that, Peter. So we'll go to, to Dan for his intervention, but I'd like to 
uh, actually, unfortunately, sort of wrap up this segment of the panel discussion already by closing with Millie, because I think Millie probably has something to say about how all of this part of the discussion is going to affect the work of um, not just the Ugandan tax authorities, but tax authorities across sub-Saharan Africa. So Dan, please. Thanks. I just want to respond to Rose and Peter. So there is a growing movement in many parts of Africa where citizens are actually increasingly questioning their governments, the kind of contracts that the governments have signed, and uh, the newspapers are playing, the media is playing a very important role. Kenya is a very good case in terms of Chinese investments. There's a lot of interest in knowing more, you know. Um, and so I think in many parts of the world, one needs that kind of transparency. And um, I, I don't know how that is going to be done or if it's possible because most governments are interested in just showcasing the fact that they were able to get this investment. Social media is, is playing a role. I hope that increases. There's something else I want to raise here and that has to do with state legitimacy because in many parts of the world where I do work, I'm not going to name names of countries, the revenue authority is jokingly called the robberies authority. Right? So, if, if the revenue authority is not to be trusted, then you know, it's, everybody thinks it's, it's, it's a free for all. And finally, I just want to respond to Peter in terms of the international level. One of the more interesting things we did as part of this expert group when we were interacting with the leadership of the World Bank, but also the UN agencies was, it was actually quite funny to hear them complain about how little money they had. So capital increase is important for the bank. But more so, I mean, UN agencies don't often like what the bank is doing. They often don't like each other. So there's this enormous dysfunction, I think, in the international system that we don't talk about. That's the elephant in the room within the UN, but also uh, across the board. So we all need more money, uh, but some of these agencies are, are absolutely struggling, and they're out competing each other. Uh, and final point in relation, going back to Rose, I think in relation to the Chinese projects particularly, a lot of African countries are thinking more and more about negotiating as a block. And I think that if we could have a system where everybody agreed, at least certain countries agreed, we will not have this company come in and extract revenue from you, we will also say no. So I think the ability to say no is going to be pretty crucial. But it's very difficult for a politician to say no to a very attractive investment. Yes, the power to say no, that's, that's the thing. Uh, let's close this segment of the conversation with you, Millie. We've heard uh, discussions, terms thrown around that I think are super important in the context of this conversation. Terms like transparency, accountability, social contracts. How do you see that affecting the work of the tax authorities in Uganda and certainly across sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, before I come to that, I wanted to, to make a comment on tax exemptions, and I wanted to make reference to the presentation made by Dr. Moses from, from uh, Kipra, is that uh, the, the, the sub-Saharan African countries have, have done whatever it takes to attract to attract investment, but it's not working. So as we are discussing the tax exemption discussion, I think we need to look at at it widely. Are there any challenges being faced by some of these countries that is driving them, them into that? Uh, and that said, I'll go back to uh, Denise, what, what you were talking about, is that all this discussion um, has been great and uh, that the issues about the social contracts and, and uh, whatever is going on impact uh, revenue administrations and Indeed, we need to have that bigger conversation and collaboration because a number of sub-Saharan African revenue administrations, unlike Norway, NORADS, are kind of uh, left alone in this whole domestic revenue mobilization journey that they are always pointed at. So it's important for us to collaborate and work together and speak together. And like has been said, all those regional blocks, we, we say no together and support each other so that we can protect the domestic revenues as they come in. But that said also, we also need to build the capacities within the, the revenue administrations and also make everyone count. I know Rose talked about savings, 
but also in terms of revenue collection, everyone needs to count. And a quick example is that in Uganda, we have a tax as low as 21 US dollars per year for, for some, someone who is doing business. So everyone needs to count if we are to come out of uh, where we are in order to mobilize revenue as aid is declining that is coming to us. Thank you, Denise. Thank you so much, Millie. Well, it's been an interesting conversation so far, uh, and I think it's time to get the participants in the room and online involved in the conversation. I have to take my glasses off now to see what's happening out there. Do we have uh, any questions from our audience? Or is everyone just looking forward to wine during the reception? Yes, we have a question from the gentleman in front here. Johnston Makubo from South African Revenue Service. Uh, perhaps a comment. Um, we are finding that increasingly, at least in South Af in Africa, that in the compilation of tax statistics, uh, tax administrations are increasingly um, starting to report on uh, tax expenditures. I'm trying to deal with the issue of investments uh, and incentives uh, without accountability and visibility. And I think the effort of tax administrations um, in Africa at least to ensure that visibility on tax expenditures is created uh, as a first step towards uh, ensuring that there is uh, a review of these uh, incentive schemes that are being discussed. And I think it's important that we, we do take that effort uh, to create the visibility uh, into account. Uh, I think uh, as tax administrations in the African context, uh, we take the importance of ensuring that we hold ourselves accountable to the incentive schemes where necessary to pronounce on the efficacy of some of these incentives as we move forward. And I think uh, in the South African context, uh, sunset clauses have been considered uh, on some of these uh, uh, incentives so that uh, the discussion is left with, with that appreciation to an extent. Thank you, moderator. Thank you so much. Do we have any further questions? Thank you. Um, I'm Alex Colvin from the Tax Justice Network. I wanted to pick up on a point Peter Chowler raised about the international aspects of this. It feels like you know, we're halfway through the Sustainable Development Goals, which in 2015 produced the first global target to curb illicit financial flows, of which corporate tax abuse is the biggest part, and that's in the UN statistical definition. We agreed that tax was the primary means of implementation and we committed to international cooperation to make sure that lower income countries who lose the greater share of their current tax revenues to tax abuse would be fully uh, engaged in the benefits of improvements. Since when, all of the evidence is clear that the problem has got worse and we have put nothing in place that includes lower income countries. So only now are we at the position that we might begin negotiations on a UN tax convention. Is it that this doesn't register politically? Is it that the opposition of high income countries is, is really what's blocking this? Um, is it that the international agencies themselves haven't got involved and pushed this hard enough? Or is there some other issue here? Why, why do we go round in this circle talking, I wonder, about whether we can make our tax administration slightly more effective when we're not giving them the tools or the data to get the international cooperation to allow them to make the kind of big reforms that would really deliver on you know, what we estimate $480 billion of revenues are lost each year to this with direct impacts on child mortality and all sorts of other outcomes. And we do nothing each year, it seems. Is this the year? Are we going for a UN convention? Are we going to fix this? Peter? That's a, it's a big question. All right, thank you, Alex. Um, 
so I, 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 I cannot speak on behalf of the UN Secretary General when I answer that kind of question, so I will give some personal reflections. Uh, the Secretary General has issued a report recently, so you can uh, see that. That is his you know, official view. Um, uh, I can plug, uh, I was in, also in the Secretariat of the Financial Accountability, Transparency and Integrity, the high-level panel, uh, a couple years ago. So I've left some copies of the report over the, on, the, on the side. It looks like a little memory stick because nobody prints papers anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it presents a lot of recommendations for these kind of, um, these kind of measures, right? Uh, to really strengthen and really makes the point that we do need to scale up international cooperation in a more inclusive and effective way. Um, member states are taking action, and I, and I have to commend the Africa group has really come together to take a leadership role in that. Um, you know, as you've said, they, they're really working in Africa to try and do some of these things. And so in New York, they've also really moved together to really push the tax agenda in New York. They tabled the resolutions last year, um, and they've, uh, you know, led the negotiations really for many years on tax issues within the G77 and within the whole um, General Assembly. So. I mean, the Africa group is absolutely present and it's absolutely front of mind to them as far as we can see. Um, I think there are, you know, long-standing political questions that are up to member states to decide. We, you know, as the secretariat, um, we should not force our views on member states. Member states have to come to a decision. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that our secretary general has talked about is the real importance of participation and inclusion We've talked about that a little bit at the domestic level, right? About how you have a social contract mm -hmm. that really people feel invested in the national tax system and the national fiscal system and they're, they're getting what they need out of it as well and that's why they want to pay into it. I think it's the same at the international level, right? Countries need to feel invested in the international tax norms and the international tax system and then they will contribute appropriately to maintenance of that system and to, to ensuring it's effective for all. And I think we haven't seen that yet, that sense that there is, uh, you know, that everybody's invested in the systems we have now and that, that produces some of the dissonance we're seeing. Um, and you, it, it's easy to go look at the, the inputs that were made for the UN's tax report, the official report from the Secretary General that was released uh, about a week or two ago, um, to see that you can see very differences of opinion amongst member states about either whether the current system is functioning or not, right? And, and whether they think it needs to be changed or not changed. And I don't think we can, as the secretariats, can overcome that for member states. Member states have to come to that view themselves. And I think there's a role for domestic accountability for how governments perform in the international environment. And maybe that's something that, you know, Dan, Dan mentioned that earlier in his conversations with the Norwegian government about that. Um, I think that's something that, that is the only way forward, is to see citizens taking that up uh, to make sure their governments are doing what they want in the international environment. Thanks for that, Peter. I also think what, uh, I don't know, Alex can correct me about this, but I also feel that uh, the floor member might be getting at a sort of a power imbalance between the global north and the global south. But Dan. I don't know, Alex, if this was part of your question, but I want to just go back to the, um, the domestic issue of uh, political legitimacy of some of these institutions. I think, I don't know if we really talked about how independent some of these institutions are and to the extent to which they are uh, uh, subject to political pressure. And in certain countries, uh, the revenue authority is often used politically to target opponents. And so that aspect, I think, is something that we often overlook, but that's not something that um, international actors or, or donors can actually talk about. This is a domestic issue, and I think uh, some of these questions become rather uncomfortable to discuss. Thank you. Rose, I'll take Rose, and then we'll come to you, Amelia. Yeah, um, I think uh, uh, there was an aspect of... Um, uh, accountability uh, in uh, mobilizing uh, resources. And maybe I just want to give um, an example of uh, what's going on uh, in my country in terms of uh, uh, enhancing 
uh, accountability in mobilization of the uh, non-tax revenue, that is uh, the appropriation in aid. Yeah? So recently, um, what uh, Kenya government has done is uh, actually to centralize uh, the channel through which uh, all government agencies, uh, including parastatal bodies, uh, including uh, ministries, receive uh, appropriation in, in aid. And the whole exercise is meant to um, uh, create uh, you know, accountability in terms of the flows of monies that come, to, that come through AINA. And uh, uh, the idea is not necessarily to uh, gag the, the, the agencies in terms of uh, receiving funds, but it's saying that uh, uh, the way the reporting has been done is actually not necessarily providing uh, adequate information on mm -hmm. or anything, everything that is coming through appropriation aid. So that's one thing I wanted to bring in. The second one is um, at the policy level. <clears throat> what is it that uh, a government is, is, is doing? And um, I would say that uh, uh, if you listen uh, uh, carefully to our president, you'll find each day he's reminding Kenyans that we have to save. Um, and one of the saving uh, channel that uh, uh, has come in is uh, what we call the uh, financial inclusion fund, or it's called the also hustler fund, and it's playing two roles. One is uh, 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 enhancing accessibility uh, by the small person, the small farms uh, to credit, small credit. But uh, when you get to uh, start repaying that credit, yeah, there's a proportionate share that you have to save. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea is that uh, you can actually uh, mobilize resources from even, even when you are just borrowing maybe $1 and you are repaying it, a small proportion, some cents, are eh, uh, put aside as, uh, as part of saving. And the whole idea is that at the end of the day, this can be a very uh, revolving fund at the end, uh, which uh, is uh, financed from the savings eh, that are coming from uh, everybody. So. It's a, it's a very uh, clear uh, direction and policy deliberate effort that the government is making uh, to facilitate uh, uh, domestic uh, savings mobilization. Thanks for that concrete example, Rose. Emilia. Thank you. Just, just two, two observations. So one on the, on the efforts in the tax incentives, and there was mentioned that you know, there is a lot of progress, and I believe we see a lot of progress in a lot of countries being more transparent, trying to report. But, you know, that's that's first stage in a sense of the reform, because not all the tax incentives are bad. And only when you start to measure their impact, intended impact, then you can try to assess whether to keep it, or maybe there is, you know, uh, cost efficiency uh, increases when you do it through direct support, for instance, not to tax exempt. So, and I think that a lot of organizations are getting to advise on, you know, second stage of the reforms, but it's, it's really, I think the progress on the first stage of reform has been uh, tremendous, and, and I think we're getting now more to this second stage conversation in many countries. On the lack of progress a little bit, I will take it from the different angle. I think the question about, you know, that 2015 had these high goals. And I look, I think that we went through the two big crises, no? and we have countries that face, you know, drop of growth by 10%, and I don't think recovery is there. And, and given all of this, I think there is still some progress in a lot of countries that have very low revenue mobilization. We just looked at the recent numbers. Countries that are below 15% of GDP, that is one of the thresholds that is discussed, that would allow finance them, public services at a certain level. Every year we see 20, 30 countries making an effort, uh, around 0.5% of GDP is being increased. So it's not like there is not progress, maybe there is not enough progress, uh, but we have all already a lot, seen a lot of crises it's on the way. Mm -hmm. So one, one have to be mindful, and I don't want us in this panel to be too critical. We see there is a gap, but I think we have to also recognize the progress. And in the bank itself, 1% on our lending goes to DRM-related effort. 
is it big or not? From four billion dollars, one percent looks like small, but for certain countries, it is it is a lot. And I think what at least we try to reflect on, because we have supported through financial instrument a lot of policy reforms, and we see a lot of reversals. So we support something, and then governments go back. So now we are trying to move to this more financing linked to the performance. Mm -hmm. So we actually build capacity and we pay against results. It's a called result-based lending. It has its own challenges because the getting results is much more difficult. So then our portfolio looks very bad because we don't disburse because the results do not happen. So that's, that's have another issues. But I think we all learning how to support this agenda. And I think probably progress needs to be we want to see more progress, but I think we have seen a lot of progress despite all these crises. Thanks. Thanks for that intervention, Emilia. I think it really was important to have a sort of reality check to indicate that things are not all going downhill. Uh, I will now give the floor to Millie. Uh, you've got your hand up, Millie. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, and I want to build it up from, uh, from Emilia, is that uh, there's all this support given to sub-Saharan Africa develop, developing economies, but we must appreciate that even us as, as these economies, we really have to, to step up our game. And I'll give an example of uh, Uganda Revenue Authority, where we've used data and statistics. Collaboration is very key. And we've grown the taxpayer register from uh, 1.3 million to 2.1 million, 800,000 taxpayers within six months. And this is because we, we, are, we, we are getting out of this ourselves. So for me, what I want to put on the table is that collaboration, coherent policies, and yes, support is good for these revenue administrations and countries. But uh, like Rose said, we have to save and we have to pay taxes. Our citizens have to pay these taxes. And we are putting in place um, easy ways for paying, we are educating, we are making it easier for everyone else to pay, so that the pressure on giving us uh, aid is reduced and we also get to feel the development of our respective countries. So Denise, what I wanted to put on the table is cross-agency intelligence, coordinated efforts, coordinated enforcement across the countries, the East Africa countries, the ECOWAS, the what if the, all these uh, revenue administration uh, regional bodies work together and improve trade across the countries, as well as improve uh, revenue uh, administration and revenues within the respective countries, as we also save, but also we need to bring in uh, revenues from, from external. For example, we need to look at remittances as well. An example of Philippines, where they are bringing in quite a lot of remittances from out there. As sub-Saharan African countries, we need to look at some of these other revenue sources in order to build our revenues and start to win ourselves of aid. Thank you so much. Yes, that's, that's the dream. Do we have any questions from the audience at this point? No? I'd just like to, uh, we're coming up to the close of the panel, but I just want to re revert to you for a moment, Emilia. You talked about um, uh, a new approach or a new movement toward uh, offering finances against results. And if we think about the fact that uh, you yourself alluded to the fact that uh, we've had a global shock, shock in terms of the pandemic, which was then followed by a war that has made things a bit more difficult, and there are many vulnerable economies that are struggling in situations such as those to show results. Uh, and I did follow a session that you were in earlier this morning where you talked about doing things in a new and different way. How can we support these kinds of vulnerable economies to show results and to get the financing that they need to achieve the SDGs in that kind of environment? Yes, yeah, so thank you. I'll be try to be short, so to give other also uh, opportunity to comment on that. Look, I think that uh, the results, uh, even small results, matters. No, and I think that uh, what we have seen, uh, uh, there is a big demand to build uh, country-specific capacity 
Uh, and there was discussion about tax administration, digitalization, uh, how much digitalization of tax administration help to you know, uh, close compliance gaps. All these you know, new uh, and behavioral experiments that are used in, in tax administration, but, but you know, to influence taxpayers, but also to influence uh, policymakers. So some of these issues, I think, uh, are achievable even in the difficult circumstances. Some of these are not politically costly. So I think what we try to do is to structure long-term programs and that would uh, try to achieve step by step some of the results. So result could be, uh, for the first year, the example of tax incentive would be to, to report. A second year could be to assess, yeah? and a third way to decide on streamlining. So I think this kind of step approach where we kind of try to identify these uh, medium-term strategies uh, using some innovative approaches, either to you know using the digital digitalization or using these behavioral approaches, I think you, it's, it, administrations are very very receptive uh, to that. Uh, so I want to mention this. But what I also want to mention, because in this conversation I I um, I think it a, a bit I, I probably missed that part. It's also very important to link the domestic revenue mobilization and some of the results expected to more broader fiscal policy aspects because I think what we forget in this discussion is that there are, you know, uh, uh, spending inefficiency and how we use our money influence also uh, the gap and then the, the need for mobilization is even more. And I, I, I believe that we all need to also base some of these result-based approaches on, you know, how to spend more efficiently, how to spend on something that could crowd in private sector. Yeah? And, uh, and I think that's um, super important to, f to not forget that this equation has also spending side. Um, and, and we are uh, also uh, gearing up to, to advise countries on how to tighten wage bill, uh, you know, in public administration, or how to more efficiently spend on education, health, etc. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's new, but I believe that um, the, the, the more comprehensive approach and more phased approach with smaller results spread through the years and the disbursement against some of these results is something that I think we are heading into. So. Thank you so much, Amelia. I think we'll close the conversation with remarks from Dan. You've got your, your hand up, so please go ahead. Very quickly, just to respond to Amelia. So there's certain low-hanging fruit that we'll actually outline in our work uh, in this report. One has to do with just showcasing what countries are doing in this financing for sustainable development field. So one easy way would be to showcase this through the TOSSD framework, the TOSD, which, is, which tracks the kind of flows that governments provide for this. This is currently under the DAC sec Secretariat in the OECD. The UN may want it. I mean, there, there are all kinds of governance issues, but uh, the United States seems to be very interested and, and, and reports under the TOSD framework. Norway should be doing it, just to showcase what people, you know, the different kinds of flows. The second has to do with, again, a low-hanging fruit. When you talk to the private sector, they say, uh, well, firstly, MEGA, et cetera, they can be very slow. They do this due diligence that takes such a long time. By the time, you know, the, the proposal is approved, you know, you've moved on. The private sector often loses interest. So one of the things that a lot of companies want is actually support in the project proposal uh, phrase, not, you know, when they've come further. So that's something, again, the public sector in many of our countries can, can support. And finally, in relation to... Uh, some of the uh, low and medium income countries. I think we haven't really talked about loss and damage, uh, but there is this interest in getting more money. And one thing I keep hearing from a lot of the ministers, including my own minister here, is that, well, it's fine with the money, but we need to see a viable plan. And I think there's something there that, that we could, in partnership, do with the tax administrator, with the revenue authorities, with the political authorities, coming up with something that can be sold as a viable plan that money could you know, be use, usefully used for. Excellent. Thank you so much for those closing remarks, Dan. And I think it's a somewhat positive note that we've ended on. So sort of chronicling you know, the small steps, the small movements toward progress that, that uh, countries are definitely making, 
uh, and encouraging more, creating a sort of a positive feedback loop, because I think the more people hear that things are making, um, are moving and are progressing, the more they're inspired to do more. And also reaching for the low-hanging fruit. But I'll give you the final word, Peter, since you insist. I want to end on a positive note, as, as you're leading <laughs> us to that. So, you know, there is... And to get back to something that, to kind of marry the comments from Amelia with Alex, I think governments are capable of doing things in the domestic environment and making progress domestically and making progress internationally at the same time. They can do both. It is possible. We've seen it. We're making progress, but we can do more. And I think that's definitely the case. Uh, the, the positive note is that there are opportunities to do more, specifically on the international environment. Right, so you have the discussions that will happen in the UN, the General Assembly, on how to take forward tax cooperation. We will have um, also uh, international summits um, on finance. It's called a Summit of the Future next year. And probably member states will agree to have a fourth international conference on financing for development in 2025. And, and I say that these are positive because the kind of big changes that some people want. You can get some low-hanging fruits, but I can feel the desire for big changes. You, to get those kind of big fruits, the mm. high-hanging fruits <laughs> right. that are really the juiciest and most succulent, we need to take the political environment to a place where it can, where it can make those kind of far-reaching changes. And so uh, those kind of big international opportunities next year and the year after are some places where, where governments can do that. And I hope we can all get our governments to the places where they can pluck those nice juicy fruits at the top, not just the low-hanging fruits at the bottom. Oh. Yes. Everything, yes. everything. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for those closing remarks, Peter. And thank you to all of our panelists, Rosen Gogi, Emilia Skrook, Peter Chawla, Dan Bannick, and Millie, Millie Nilakogwe. I'm sorry, I've got your name wrong. Um, but Millie, please forgive me. I will make it up to you in another forum. Uh, I think uh, there's a lot to think about and there's a lot to talk about and there's an excellent opportunity upcoming for you to continue the conversations, the discussions, the deliberations, to reach for the low-hanging and the high-hanging fruit, to go for small increments and big steps, to act locally, regionally and internationally and let's just make this thing happen. Thank you so, so much, all of you, for joining in, for attending, for giving us your attention this afternoon after what I'm sure has been a very long day. Thanks again.